Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. If you will, stand with us as we begin our service with 353. We'll sing all three verses of victory in Jesus. And in case you haven't noticed, I have a little bit of a cold. So I'm just going to lip sync while these two lovely ladies lead us. Are you ready? and I've been to football games when I've seen victories. I know that you have more spirit than that. As we sing this last verse, it says, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. Are you excited about that? Yes. Well, let's hear it, right, Kathy? Yes. All right, verse 3. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. Ago, 
few different people here today. Question is, do you have anything to be grateful about and look forward to in 2015? Please raise your hand if you have anything to be grateful. Oh, we're seeing a few more hands today than last time. Last time I shared, we all have Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved with faith, through faith. And so we all have that to look forward to. And so uh, we should all be grateful about 2015, about something that we can share with others, too. Um, <clears throat> a few announcements this morning. Uh, number one, not necessarily number one priority, but just on my list. Uh, trustees uh, are going to reschedule the work date on March 28th. Uh, I'm not sure of a date yet on that. Um, there is no evening service tonight. Tonight is care group. And if anyone is interested in care groups, care groups are small groups that meet together and uh, have a time of devotion and uh, fellowship together uh, in a smaller atmosphere than you know, a large church service, but it's a time where you can meet other people in the church. And if you'd like to be involved in that, why please let uh, someone in the office, let Michelle or, or someone know about that, and uh, we'll try and find you a care group to be with. It's a time of encouragement and growing in the Lord together in small groups. Um, and there is not a Wednesday, <clears throat> my notes here are kind of shaky, Wednesday morning adult lunch. I guess that's a Wednesday noon adult lunch uh, this Wednesday. Um, oh yes, and um, deacons wanted to just mention that during bad weather, which, bad weather, during um, Weather where it's difficult to get around, uh, the policy is we will have Sunday morning church because pretty much no matter how bad weather it is, pastor can make it over to from the sanctuary. And if it's and if if he can't make it from there to here, there's there's no question about what's going to happen. But uh, the point is too though, if where you are at uh, seems dangerous and to come to church, then then take that into consideration. But but. Typically, we will have a Sunday morning church service during heavy snows and, and different things like that. So, just keep that in mind. Um, and then we have Vicki. Vicki has an announcement. Well, I have some good news for you. Summer will be here soon. <laughs> and, five, and it's hard to think about it now, it's so cold. But in five months, That'll be the Board of Christian Ed has set the Vacation Bible School for July. And it's going to be July 20th through the 24th. And we are starting to plan this. And I'm asking for you, as the church, to start praying. Because this is a very important thing, um, I believe, that when we do this Vacation Bible School with our children. So that's all we're asking for now. Thank you. It's a critical thing. Okay, start praying for you. Yes. Um, okay, at this time, are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, let's stand and greet each other with the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> Father, we come before you now, Lord, each one of us with much to be grateful for, Lord, most of all for your love, 
in the life that you've given to us. And Lord, I just pray that you, now that you would uh, bless these offerings, that it might be used to glorify your name and to share that message with those around us in the days to come. make it sound so easy, but sometimes don't realize how much hard work they do <coughs> presenting those songs to us. We're going to continue with our lively pace this morning. Stand as you're able as we sing hymn number 730, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, it is with hearts that desire to worship you, hearts that seek to show you how important you are in every aspect of our lives. Lord, as we come together, we know that we bring with us different cares, different concerns, different questions on our heart. And today, Lord, we lay those down at the feet of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that you would work in each of our lives. Father, we know that there are people that are amongst us this morning that are dealing with health situations. We lift them up to you and pray for your healing. But there are some perhaps here that are dealing with relationship issues. Lord, we pray that you would work and bring restoration there. Perhaps there are people here that are struggling financially. Lord, we know that you own the cattle of a thousand hills, and you can provide and do. Whatever it is, Lord, we ask that as we come together this morning, that we do so mindful that we have a great God, a living God, a powerful God, a gracious God, a holy God, and a loving God. And we come together to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated now as the choir sings a glorious day.
Well, good morning, everybody. At this time, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church. As the choir comes down to join you and the children are dismissed for Children's Church, you know, it's always interesting in life, you know, you know, when the world gives you lemons, you're supposed to make lemonade. Uh, this past week, I've been sick for a couple days, and it's wreaked havoc um, with my throat and my um, lungs and my voice, and, you know. But I figure, you know, all every time in choir, I sing tenor, the high part for the matter. And so days like this, I get to sing bass. And so I get to be a real man. So, yeah. It always makes me laugh because choir directors will go, you know, they'll talk about the ladies and the sopranos and the altos and then go, all right, men, talking about the basses, and they leave us tenors out. So I got to be a real man today. So, our passage for this morning as the choir comes down to join you is in 1 Samuel, and we've been in 1 Samuel for this uh, past month. We've been looking at this um, exchange, and we've been seeing examples from the life of David as they come down. We're going to read just a few verses from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 49 to 51, as we conclude our series on being used by God. Uh, so, as you are able, if you'll stand as we read 1 Samuel 17, verses 49 to 51. <laughs> and I just share with somebody, I said I recognize that over the last couple of weeks our servants have been a little bit long. And they pointed out the fact to me that I have some control over how long the sermons are. And so we'll see how that works. 1 Samuel 17, verse 49 to 51 says, Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck, or struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took, the, took a sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his hand with it. And with the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. Or when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning. We thank you for all the ways that you have provided for us to love you and to worship you and to serve you. And we thank you for all those that have participated in this service this morning, helping us to get to the place where we can, with spirit, in spirit and truth, worship you. And Lord, that is our desire. We pray now as we consider your word that you would speak to our heart, that you would challenge and encourage each and every one of us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, again, as we have been looking over this last month, the idea of being used by God, we saw the first week how God uses ordinary people. Ordinary, but obedient. Ordinary but obedient. And we were reminded how that idea of obedient, it means to be willing to listen. To simply listen to God. That when God calls us or when God asks us, his expectation is that we're going to listen to him. And we say, well, duh, you know. But many times in our spiritual lives, we don't do that. So if we want to be used by God, we can be ordinary, common folk, but we have to be obedient. Then we talked about how God wants to and can use consecrated people. And we talked about how that word was like a cup that was, or our hands being cupped, ready to be filled, wanting to be filled by God. And we talked about how we, as individuals, we are made able to serve. We, are made, uh, we ought to be made available to serve and made active to serve. So we ask ourselves, will we listen to God? Will we let God use us? Last week we talked about God uh, using us as committed people. <clears throat> and we talked about how that idea of commitment means to entrust. All right? That in our mind of commitment, we have control. I say how long you can use this or, or whatnot, and then I say when it's over, and I take it back. But this idea of commitment is surrender. It's submission. It's entrusting to God, our all. God can use us if we give him our all. 
So we ask, will we listen? Will we let God use us? And will we entrust our all to Him? And that brings us now to our last thought, as we desire to be used by God. And this point kind of rolls all these other ideas together. And it's kind of similar in some ways, but it is that God uses <laughs> courageous people. God uses courageous people. Now, courage is a word that we're very familiar with. We like courage, right? We value it, and we hope to demonstrate it, but it's meaning that it's sometimes a little bit hard for us to come up with. This uh, past couple of weeks, we've been having a, a study uh, with the men on Wednesday evening, and one of the sessions was about courage and trying to define courage and what does courage mean and to some it was thought to be the absence of fear to others it was doing the right thing no matter the cost every time well as we look at the Bible we see a slightly different word really than that a slightly a different meaning when we consider this idea of being courageous what does it mean well it means to be strong, okay, that doesn't clear things up too much. It means to be bold. It means to be alert. It means to be determined. It means to be firm. It means to be hardened. And I like this one, and I won't tell you why, but I like this one. It means to be obstinate. You know anybody that's obstinate? <laughs> When, this, when the Bible talks about being courageous, it's having a character or quality of obstinance. And so as we get started, I want to share with you just very quickly, and I know some of you are just going to, you're going to hear all this, but I, I want to demonstrate the importance of this quality of courage, of this quality of being firm, of being steadfast of being determined. In the Old Testament, more than 20 times, more than 20 times, we see phrases like, be of good courage. Now, if you'd like to take notes, I'll give, I could give you a list of 20 different Bible verses in the Old Testament, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in Joshua, in 2 Samuel, in 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, in Ezra, in Psalms, and in Isaiah, and I have them all listed out. And I could go through them all, but they all use those words. Be of good courage, or be strong and be courageous, or uh, behave courageously, or be courageous and valiant. And so the question is, if in the Old Testament, 20 times the people of God are given the message to be courageous, what do you think the message is for us? We often talk about how when things are repeated, it is to emphasize them. You know? And we talk about, I always love to talk about negatives in Hebrew. Because in our negatives, double negatives cancel each other's out, each other's out, and it just makes a mess. But in Hebrew, uh, they, when they use negatives, it emphasizes it. So, you know, and I think I've said this before. If I say, I don't got no money, that means, you know, I do have money. Because I say, I don't got no money. So those cats that see you with me. Cody says, an English lesson on Sunday morning? Seriously? No. Well, that means I do money. In Hebrew, if I say I don't got no money, that means I am poor. So as we look through these pages, the message from God, 20 times, it's to be courageous. So what do you think God wants? He wants us as people of God to be Courageous, And again, understanding that the meaning of that word is to be strong, to be bold, to be alert, to be determined, to be firm, to be hardened, to be obstinate. Now, committed, which we talked about last week, meant that we entrusted. We entrusted. Whatever the obstacles, whatever the objections, whatever the opportunities, that we didn't turn back or take back. Or get sidetracked. Courage or courageous means that we keep moving forward. All right? They're similar. But the one says, no, I'm not going to turn back. No, I'm not going to take it back. No, I'm not going to give it up. 
The other says, not only am I not going to give it up, not only am I not going to take it back, but I'm going to keep going this way with you, God. I'm going to keep moving forward with you, God. I'm going to keep allowing you to have progress in my life, God. I'm going to keep allowing you to work so that I grow and so I can become closer to you, God. That's courage. So yes, they're similar, but they're different. We want to be people that are courageous. That, that means that we keep moving forward. God used people that were create courageous, people that would move forward, that would take the risks, the ridicule, and the results. And those are our points this morning. First, we want to recognize that God uses people that will take the risks. God uses people that will take the risks. Now again, <clears throat> a risk, what is that? Well, in English, it's an exposure to the possibility of loss or injury. Debbie says, oh, he pastor got his dictionary out this week. Yes. <clears throat> All right, it's an exposure to the possibility of loss or injury. When we think in terms of a risk. And you know, we risk all kinds of things. You know, they were just talking about if the weather's bad and you don't feel safe coming to church because the roads might be icy, you know, don't take the chance, don't take the risk. You know, and we record our sermons, and I know, I know when you miss a sermon, you just, oh, I, oh, I know you beat yourself up, but you can go on YouTube, you can go on Facebook and get it, we even have DVDs of them, you know, if, if you want one, we can get it for you. We risk all kinds of things, but a risk when we talk about it biblically has a different idea. The focus is not on the possibility of loss. The focus is on the willingness to give up, to give away, or to hand over something. Now you say it's, it's a different kind of giving up than we talked about when we were talking about being committed. But to take a risk for us is to give something away, to give something up, a willingness to do that. David in 1 Samuel, as he faces Goliath, he was willing, he was willing to give his life to stand for God and for his people. David wasn't an idiot. David wasn't crazy. He knew going up against Goliath, well, you know, if they were going to place odds, the odds were not in his favor. Swished. Real easy. Yet, David courageously went forward. He went ahead. In Acts chapter 15, verse 25 to 27, it says, It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same thing by word of mouth. In that passage, it talks about those people that were willing to go. They risked. They were willing to forfeit their life for what? The message of Christ. Risk, or biblical risk, I should say, is not a calculation. It's not, am I willing to lose this or to lose that? Biblical risk is a decision. It's a determined, courageous decision that says, if I'm asked to give this, I will give it. David was asked, and David gave. He held nothing back. He moved forward courageously. What are we holding back today in 2015? February 22nd. What are we holding back? Is it our money? Oh, well, you know, Baptist pastor had to go there. I remember when they used to tell me about how they would have um, uh, a payroll Sunday. Churches used to do this. Do you remember that? When Yeah, people say no because it's, it hasn't happened in such a long time. Where people would come and give everything, their whole paycheck to the church. 
I'm going to have the deacons meet right after church. No. If we did that, I guarantee next week we would have the lowest attendance church service we've ever had. No. What about our family? Are you willing to give your family, your kids, you know? Katie turned 18. <coughs> She's an adult. She's this close to being out the door, and she can taste it, you know? And it's hard. The first day of school, when she did, went back as a senior, I, had, I just did the chop right there and said, okay, it's time. She's ready. If she's not ready by now, she's never going to be ready. So, but then there's Lucas. Lucas is four. I don't want Lucas going anywhere. Lucas still proudly proclaims that he loves me, you know? So Paul can hear, Katie, do you love me? <laughs> there will be conversations later, you know? <laughs> what are we holding back? It can be anything. Our hobbies, our gifts, our talents, our skills, our time. Being courageous means that we say to God, like we said, commit it. We entrust it all, and then we move forward. And if he says, I want $5 today, we give him $5. Tomorrow he says, I want $10, we give him $10. The next day he says, I want it all, you know what? We give it all. Now that's when God tells you. If the pastor stands up here and tells you to give it to him, Ask, ask a couple questions first. But if God speaks to you in your heart saying, you need to do this, guess what? Courage means do it. Will we take the risk? Because God uses people that will take the risks. He also uses people that will take the ridicule. And again, this is similar to commitment. But don't forget, commitment is not, is, 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 is not turning back. It's not getting sidetracked. Courageous people move forward in the face of ridicule. And ridicule means to, to laugh, to scorn, to deride, to mock, <clears throat> to make fun of. And I wish I had another way, another biblical fancier word for that, but that's what it is. No one likes to be ridiculed, do we? No one likes to be made fun of. David in 1 Samuel, as he was preparing to meet Goliath, the others made fun of him. Remember in verse 28, we talked about this before. It says, why did, they said, why did you come here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. So they're like, you know, your only job was to watch a couple sheep. <coughs> and you know, the shepherd was normally uh, the job, the sheep herding was the job that was normally given to the one that had no other abilities. I would have been right there. They would have said, all right, Matthew. You know. What are you doing here? What do you think you're going to accomplish? You just want to see a battle. That's what they thought. Last week, we mentioned it in the context of being committed despite objection. Here again, we see it in light of the idea of this ridicule. Here was David doing the right thing. And what does he get for it? Grief. You know? I'd like to be able to say that every time you do the right thing, people are going to cheer and applaud and say, yay! Sunday night, we've been looking at the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was, was um, struck and, and pained by the fact that his home city of Jerusalem and their, their wall, their gate, had been just demolished that it devastated him. So he goes, and he goes out there to rebuild that gate because God has laid it on his heart. So he courageously goes and does some other courageous things along the way, too. But as he gets there, there's a couple guys, Tobias and Sandbell and some others, and they just make fun of him. What do you think you're doing? Here he was trying to fix the gate, trying to fix the town up. They ridiculed him. 
In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the story of Jesus healing the ruler's daughter. He says, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And scripture says, they ridiculed him. Stupid guy. Can't you see she's dead? This guy doesn't even know the difference between someone who's dead and somebody who's sleeping. And they call him the Savior. David did the right thing and got ridiculed. Nehemiah did the right thing and got ridiculed. Jesus did the right thing and got ridiculed. Guess what? So will we. But pay attention because the lesson is not that they got ridiculed. Here's the lesson. They got ridiculed but courageously continued to allow God to use them. David got ridiculed, but it didn't stop him. Nehemiah got ridiculed, but it didn't stop him. <clears throat> Jesus got ridiculed, but he still healed her and raised her from the dead. Sadly for us, many times, the ridicule comes and it stops us right in our tracks. And again, that's the goal of it, isn't it? We have an enemy, Satan, that if he can't stop us from getting saved, well, he'll stop us from being effective once we are saved. <clears throat> and sometimes that comes in the form of words hurled at us. And as much as we like to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, they hurt, don't they? They hurt. But they pressed on. They continued the work. They continued to be obedient. They continued to say yes. They continued to give it all. You know what, First Baptist Church? We're going to be ridiculed if we serve God. We will be ridiculed for what we do. We will be ridiculed for what we don't or won't do. But the real truth that we need to get a hold of is this. Asking ourselves this question. What if we aren't being ridiculed? It might suggest that we're not stepping out of our comfort zones enough. You know, if we stand, stand up for Jesus in the sanctuary, we won't be ridiculed, will we? If we stand up for Jesus in the classroom, we might. If we stand up for Jesus in the Sunday school room, we're not going to be ridiculed. But if we stand up in the office, we might. If we stand up for Jesus in the prayer meeting, we won't be ridiculed. But if we stand up for Jesus in the grocery store, we might. Are we prepared? Are we willing to take the ridicule? Are we willing to be known as, oh, they're one of those people. They're one of those Christian people. Are we willing to stop if we go out to lunch on Sunday afternoon after church? Are we willing to stop and to pray publicly in front of all the people at Pizza Hut or El Puerto's or the Chinese restaurant or Wendy's? Are we willing? Or Subway, that's right. Are we willing to do that? Oh, well, we don't have enough time. Let's just, we'll just eat it real quick. Are we willing to proudly stand up for Jesus? To proudly claim him as our Lord and Savior? Or do we just do it at church? God uses people that courageously take the risk, that courageously take the ridicule. And finally, God uses people that are willing to take the results, no matter what. David, he stepped forward into the battle, not knowing for sure how it would end. What about us? We like to know how things are going to end. You know, I was reading about the missionary Adam Iram Judson. I'm stuttering here. 
at a night on Jetson. And he went out, he was one of the first missionaries, and he went to Burma. And he went, and he served, and he served, and he served. And it was years, years before he saw any response to his service. Years. Would we be willing to wait that long? This morning somebody was talking to me about how we live in an instant gratification society. We have instant potatoes, instant rice, everything is instant. We don't want to wait for anything. <clears throat> and yet so very often, waiting is a big part of what we do, isn't it? Especially spiritually. We wait on the Lord. But he went out there and it took years before he began to see the response. Would we be willing to do that? Would we be willing to press on in face of perhaps adverse results? You know? I just said that if we serve God, if He uses us, we're likely to be ridiculed. And some of you might say, man, that's crazy. Is it though? It's only crazy if we focus on ourselves. When we stop and we remember that we are part of a bigger picture. We are part of a better picture. We are part of a, a plan that is like a giant puzzle. Have you ever put a, a jigsaw puzzle together? I love jigsaw puzzles, but we never do it. Two years ago, for Christmas, I saw somebody that they said that every year they put a Christmas jigsaw puzzle together. And so I went out and bought myself a Christmas jigsaw, jig, 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 jigsaw puzzle. It still is in the box, has never been opened. You know? Christmas is always so busy. You know? But if you've ever done one, you spread those pieces out. You know, and some of the pieces are, are so beautiful and, and multicolored, and, and they're just really nice to look at. And then there's others that if it's, it's a scene with clouds that could just be white. Very plain. Some of them are shaped like you expect them to be shaped, and then others have these odd shapes. But you know what? It's not till every piece is put together, right, that we see the picture. Sometimes the particular piece that we're working on right now, it may be a plain piece that doesn't seem to be all that noteworthy. It may be a difficult piece. Some of those pieces are a little bit stubborn to get in there. If you ever do a puzzle with Lucas, you never know what you're going to get because he hasn't quite figured out that there's actually, you know, an order. And so he gets them all in even when they don't go there. But when all the pieces of the puzzle are put together, what it reveals the picture, the purpose, the point. Being courageous means that we are strong, we are steadfast, we are determined, we are firm, because we know that we are part of God's plan. Not my plan, not man's plan, God's plan. Even if the results of what we do are not what we thought or what we prefer. You know, several years ago, there was a young pastor that was serving in a metropolitan community. He was the assistant pastor of a church that had been there for decades. And in case you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about myself. So. And I loved serving there. I would have served there forever. It was close to family, close to shops. You know, everything was convenient. There was this one pizza place that took a check, and you could get ribs and lasagna and pizza. Oh, I was in heaven. Well, not quite. But two years after serving there, God changed the plan. I didn't serve there any longer. I was devastated. I actually cried. I called my father-in-law and said, I can't provide for your daughter. And he said, well, that's okay, Matthew. I didn't say anything about Natty or Katie. They were there then, but I didn't, you know, I didn't say too much about them. But you know what? Six weeks later, I was called to serve a church in rural Michigan. And we were there for nine years. 
God took what I thought was a devastating crush on my life, crushing, and he turned it into something glorious. And then, of course, after that, he landed me here, and we haven't quite decided how that's going just yet. No, just kidding. <laughs> But you know, if we stop and we think and we say, well, the results aren't what I expected. Well, they worked one day, but six weeks later, I was excited about the results. I was praising God because of the results. I was telling people, you know what, God, I would not have left if God had not done that. God knew exactly what needed to happen in my life to get me in a position where he could use me. At the time, I was like, ugh. But now I sit there and go, yes. Aren't we glad that we have a God that works like that? Amen. And I hope you're not like me because I <clears throat> do need a, a swift kick in the rear to, to get the message across to me. If we stop when we run into results that we don't like, we won't get to see what God has next. We won't get to see the larger context. David was willing to see the results. So must we. This month, we've explored the idea of God using us and what it takes. We must be obedient. We must be willing to listen. We must be made able and made available and made active to serve. We must entrust our all. And we must be courageous. We must be determined in moving forward with God. Whatever the risks, whatever the ridicule, whatever the results, do we want to be used by God? Are we willing to give it our all? Are we willing to face the laughter, the scorn? Are we willing to look past the circumstances? If we are, then God can use us. God can use us, and he wants to use us because he loves us. And he loves us so much, of course, we remember the great demonstration of his love was him sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. You know, each one of us, as we sit here in this room, we all carry baggage. We all have problems in our lives. We all have situations that we're dealing with. And I hope and pray that every one of us that is here today has come to the point in their life at one time or another when they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because we all need it. We all need him. Because the Bible tells us that there is how many righteous? None. How many is none? Zero. There is none righteous. No, not one. Tells us that the all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many is all? Oh, don't you hate when they use those words? In counseling, they always tell you never to say never or always. You know, so none at all. There's no arguing with that. All have sinned. What's the wages of sin? Death. Separation from God for all eternity. No matter how many good works we do, no matter how much money we give the pastor or give the church or give to charities, we can't do it. So God did it for us. He sent his son Jesus. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, this morning, and you've not yet accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, make that choice today. Because you know what? We're not promised a tomorrow, are we? We're not promised another hour. Recognize, one, that you have sin, because we all do. Recognize that that sin separates you from God, and there's nothing you can do to fix it. Recognize that, three, God provided the way to take care of that through Jesus. And then accept that free gift. Accept that truth. By grace, through faith, we have been saved. Not of works. I hope that all of you that are here today have made that choice. If not, make it today. And we will celebrate with you. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. 
God, I thank you for the chance to be here. I thank you for each one that is here. And Lord, I do pray that your spirit would speak to each heart, speak to my heart, God. That you would challenge us and encourage us and draw us closer to you and closer to one another. I pray that you would give me the courage, give me the determination, give me the strength that I need to serve you, to be used by you. I pray that your Holy Spirit helps me to be obedient and calls me to be obedient. I pray that you would encourage me to be consecrated, to be ready to be used by you. And that I would be committed in trusting it all to you. But we pray too, most of all, Lord, that each one of us that is here can celebrate the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Can celebrate that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We ask that you would speak and that you would move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand as you are able as we sing our song of invitation. scheduled Sunday evening service. Instead, we will have care groups, and um, there is the UNO group meets here this evening at 6.30 p.m., so uh, if you're interested in participating in that group, you're welcome to. But let's be dismissed with prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and this time that you've blessed us with. We pray that as we go to our homes or other destinations, that your presence would remain with us, and that you would give us opportunity to demonstrate your love through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.